Hello, everyone. Welcome to Marketing 3771, Traffic and Transportation Management. My name is Mike Edwards. Many of you already know that. So I appreciate you coming back and joining me uh, on the uh, second leg of this journey um, as we uh, move into a, uh, a far more focused uh, format of uh, what transportation management is all about. This class has been pretty much redesigned from the ground up, and it's been redesigned because we've gotten some input from uh, some of our employers that say that they are looking for some uh, enhanced skills for the transportation people that we that are are interested in pursuing this as a career. Uh, and so we've uh, what I've done is I've kind of reoriented this a little bit towards um, what they're looking for. So when you interview with some of these folks. Um, you can say that you are familiar with these concepts, with these terms, um, and that you do bring an understanding um, to, to the workplace. Uh, of course, a lot of you already have a job, but, uh, and uh, I applaud you for that, but this uh, might help you as you, as you go forward. So uh, we'll start with this, and uh, we'll see where it all takes us. We can always uh, adjust a little bit if we need to, see so if we can get this up. Here we go. All right, so um, when we came into this year, uh, there was a um, uh, uh, the World Bank or the uh, I, I'm sorry, the IMF put out uh, an economic outlook in October of 2016, which we discussed a little bit um, in some of the previous classes. So in spring of 17, uh, they came out with a new uh, communique. So I, what I'm going to do is I, I want to start off with talking about macroeconomics because you all know. Um, from the previous classes that macroeconomics um, has a dramatic impact on transportation. The transportation is driven by supply and demand and what happens around the world does affect uh, what happens in transportation management. So let's, let's kind of reset where we are coming out of, uh, coming into the fall now. And um, we'll see if you agree with it. Uh, hopefully you do. So let's go on to the next slide and let's uh, keep going here. Okay, so when we came into 2017, the IMF was basically saying that um, the the outlook was reasonably positive, um, and they projected some uh, fairly decent increases for uh, regions around the world uh, to experience uh, a, a higher growth rate. And um, they're very concerned about China um, because can China sustain the rate uh, that it has? Uh, we, we also know that China's numbers tend to be suspect uh, because of the fact that it is a controlled economy. Uh, we were looking at commodity exports as being one of the drivers, Federal Reserve rate increases, the presidential election, and Brexit. So where do we find ourselves here in uh, eight months into, into 2017? Let's take a look. So when we come in from, from, so what the IMF and the World Bank is basically saying is that there's absolutely uh, economic growth. It is gaining momentum, uh, but it's modest. And I think uh, we can you'll see this as we go through this. Um, commodity prices have indeed recovered from some of the depressed rates that we saw in 2016. Um, and we even are seeing uh, commodity exports from the United States into China, uh, which has been a dramatic turnaround. Um, as some of you, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, just recently China uh, is permitting the United is permitting Im imports of rice, imports of rice into China from the United States. So that's a first. Uh, it's always been pretty much uh, very highly uh, have some very heavy duties applied to it, and because of their the growth, the rapid growth of their population from a middle class standpoint, as they transition into more of a market. Um, demand economy, um, they have less and less people focused on farm and they can't there. So ex the exports from the United States have tended to be more in the commodity range where we're an area that we uh, absolutely excel at because we have the ability to do um, large manufacturing, specialty specialty farming, um, just due to our, just due to the way that we're set up now. Uh, deflation has certainly decreased. Um, and on the, on the downside is this, is that there's still a tremendous uh, amount of uncertainty out there that's holding back um, investments. It's holding back uh, investments not only in, uh, in the United States, 
but investments of U.S. companies in overseas locations, and it's clearly holding back the government. And as you as you'll see here, you'll see that the government spending uh, and business spending. I mean, even business spending is is being is being held hostage by this by this total uncertainty that's out there right now, um, and and uh, the risks that are out there. Uh, there's a lot of risk out there. We'll talk a little bit about some of the risks, but they're clearly out there, and they're all they all have a negative impact on uh, U.S. GDP growth and even and world GDP growth because. The world economy uh, is very heavily driven by the U.S. economy. So here's um, here's the modifications that kind of came out of this. Uh, the numbers in green are the new projections. So you can see that global growth um, was projected in 2016 uh, to be 2.7, and it's been revised now to 3.8. Um, the majority of this is coming from um, the developed economies. Um, this is not this is uh, other than in this case, the U.S. is actually will actually uh, actually comes down, as you'll see in just a second. Uh, but other economies just due to particularly the EU, for example, uh, India, uh, which is going to be down in here. Um, they're starting to they're starting to develop um, and um, GDP growth is coming as they are um, as they are uh, moving more into a market uh, economy. Um, the EU, from the standpoint that they've seemed to have weathered, they've gone from, they still have some of their negative interest rates, but it's that's slowly diminishing, and uh, they are seeming to be coming back. China, on the other hand, dropped. So China dropped from 6.7 uh, projection down to 6.6, .6. still uh, a very important number uh, on the number two economy in the world. Um, and uh, most important thing that's driving this is imports. So Chinese imports is what's is what is one of the key things that's happening and uh, those imports are coming from all over the world but from the united states perspective it's basically uh commodity driven um and you'll see that in uh, just a second where we still have this free trade fair trade argument going on that um that the administration is uh understandably and you know perhaps even justifiably trying to remedy um, most of the activity in the world, in the rest of the world, is being driven by public and private investment. Um, there's uh, some major, major investment issues, particularly out of China, particularly out of China, which is everywhere um, that the other, where the everywhere the developed economies are not. So um, they are in uh, they are in Africa, where most of the developed economies are not. Um, they're in uh, South America. Uh, Central America, and as you may have heard, and you'll, uh, you'll I'll put this in the article section, uh, China did build a railroad uh, from uh, into Europe, and uh, so it's called the, uh, it's, it's not the Silk Road, which kind of goes through the southern side, but it's, uh, what do they call it? It's, I think it's called this, well, I'll figure it out. But anyway, they they have they have built a railroad that goes from China directly into Europe. It takes 17 days, but that's half the time it takes a ship to go around through the canal and into into Europe. So the alternative now coming out of China into Europe is rail, and the and the congestion that that's causing is more as people, as companies are are using rail. Um, as a solution is is very interesting, but that is a multi-billion dollar investment. And the Silk Road is also uh, down into um, Southeast Asia uh, is also becoming a uh, is a multi-billion dollar, uh, multi, I think it's a trillion dollar investment. Um, and the, the U.S. is trying to participate in that to the best of their extent. So again, the major advanced economies, which is, of course is the EU basically and uh, the U.S., um, the policy uncertainty is all over that, and that's holding that's holding back what we're seeing up here and domestically within those particular uh, economies. Uh, we're seeing uh, if this can be reversed, then we will see stronger than expected activity. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. For example, if infrastructure gets passed, if tax increases get if tax decreases get passed, if tax reform gets passed, 
uh, I think you can expect to see a dramatic Im uh, um, improvement in U.S. GDP. Uh, commodity importing companies, um, that's, that's again, this is, plays right into our into the hands of the U.S. right now and other countries. We compete, of course, with other countries like Brazil, for example, on many commodities. Um, but uh, right now we're in a very good, very good position. Oil and gas, we're exporting uh, at rates that we've never exported before. And um, that's also helping a, a lot, too. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, the developments in the U.S. economy do have effects beyond uh, just what happens here in the state. So if the situation reverts, if we do not see some of these activities, then uh, we could see financial conditions change. I think I don't think so. The latest CPI just came out recently was just a one tenth of one percent. So this is in the face of every traditional economic rule that ever existed that when that when demand exceeds supply, prices rise. So demand has exceeded supply, particularly in the labor market, and prices are not rising. So it, it's 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 against every economic argument that's been out there for for a uh, hundred years. Uh, and the continued uncertainty, of course, will reverberate the other way. So here you've seen this slide, I believe many of you've seen this slide before. This is the uh, the latest slide of GDP. And in here, you can see here's the U.S. sitting here at 24. Here's China at 14. I'm going to come back to this in just a minute. Um, but you can then see where everybody else is um, in, in, in the world. You can see some of the other. Um, you can see uh, here's the, uh, let's see if we get this to come out. Well, there's the EU. So we'll, we'll see what happens with all that. But I'm going to come back to that in just a second because I want to show you what is going to happen. Let's see if I my cursor, I'll get it. There we go. Okay, so this is this is a relatively new chart that talks about GDP growth. And you can see where is the GDP growth coming. And if you look at this carefully, you see it right here, India. Um, and you can see China is continuing to grow. Uh, Asia is continuing to grow as as a, this would be uh, Southeast Asia, um, and you're, you'll see uh, you'll see also. I'm looking over here because I can see it better. Uh, the, those are the major Mexico. Mexico is down in here. Um, this is Africa, but again, it's coming off of a much smaller base. So when you look at the bases of what the economy represents now. Um, it, th those kinds of trends kind of show you as, the, as these countries are emerging now and they're moving towards more market uh, situations, particularly India, which, which uh, potentially has the ability to overtake China um, in, uh, in population, uh, maybe not GDP, but in, but in population uh, in, the next, in the next decade or so. Uh, the interesting thing about India is it's gone from a very uh, protectionist type economy in terms of business investment and the business uh, business environment to a far more open environment. I can remember going into India and uh, trying to work with uh, joint ventures over there, and it was very difficult to do. But now that you were not able to buy uh, Indian companies, um, and now you can do that, um, the rules have been relaxed. Uh, when China relaxed their joint venture, and, you, and com countries were able to or companies from foreign countries were able to buy JVs. Um, that was one of the launching pads for the Chinese growth. Um, likewise, the growth in the markets themselves, the fact that you have a, a, an emerging middle class in India, an emerging middle class in China that is looking for more of the traditional uh, values associated with the middle class uh, the consumption rates are just uh, off the charts. And um, uh, so these are uh, the same in Mexico, for that matter. So the fact that there's talk about raising the, what we call the de minimis level of e-commerce um, on a country by country basis, unfortunately, because of the lack of uh, uh, multilateral trade agreements. Um, these countries are going to want more and more U.S. goods. If we can get that level up from the current, uh, depends on what country you're in, 
Uh, in Canada, it's $50. Uh, Mexico, it's $50. I think it's like it's $200 elsewhere, but they're talking about raising it to 800. So that will launch a lot of things if that happens. So watch this GDP growth because that's the key to all of it. Okay, so let's take a look at the U.S. real quick. Um, this is um, this is a the newest uh, version of this. So as we know, things are pretty much plugging along. They're plugging along at two to two point two. The numbers right now uh, are still suggesting that maybe even a little lower. And a lot of that's going to depend upon some of the things we talk about in the next few slides. Uh, we've reached an unemployment rate, which many would consider to be the natural level of, of in this range. However, uh, the Fed, and I, I certainly agree with them, uh, suggests the U6 rate, which is the real unemployment rate, is far more important than the historical rate here that you hear a lot about. The U6 rate, uh, which consists of people that are have stopped looking, are working part time but want to work full time, um, is is quite different and is double this. Um, and what this is suggesting is what the economists call structural unemployment, and that is is that the people that are looking for jobs, there's jobs out there, but the skill sets don't match the jobs, and that's called structural unemployment. So there's this mismatch between skills and jobs. The other issue is the location. The jobs are not where many of these people are. And um, even the administration said uh, Americans are going to have to move. They're going to have to move to the jobs. And the jobs are not in areas that are not easily um, part of a metropolitan area, which is where the majority of the people live. Uh, and where the majority of the jobs are. So people living in rural America, and I mean really rural America, not what we call the exurbs, which are on the outside of the suburbs, but even beyond that, their chance of, of finding uh, employment continues to diminish. And one of the things that can reverse that is transportation, because transportation is how we develop suburbs. So if we can develop transportation networks that bring these two together, then the jobs may be able to move out another, uh, a little further away from the major metropolitan, from the metropolitan area um, and create some of this unemployment, but, or de decrease some of this unemployment. But this mismatch between skills um, is a critical thing. And so uh, uh, this is the challenge that we have. We're looking at um, inflation rates of roughly 1.6%. The Fed, as you probably, if you may have read, is, continues to be surprised by this. Um, the fact that inflation is not approached to. Um, again, uh, every, every, the signs point to this number is, is okay. U.S. manufacturing, on the other hand, is doing quite well. It's up three, it's up three points. Um, but employment is not there because it's being offset by automation in many cases. Uh, and we are, they are saying, they were projecting in the spring that we'll see a rate from the current 1.25 to 1.5. That is, um, that is, that may be off the table. That was on the table up until just recently when the CPI has shown no indication to grow. So this may or may not happen. And again, this is against all the traditional economic rules. Why? Well, here's why. One reason why is a dollar. So what you're seeing here is what's happening to the dollar. Now, normally what happens with the dollar in the U.S. is that as a dollar declines, uh, it's cheaper for countries to buy U.S. Uh, products. Um, and when the dollar goes the other way, it becomes cheaper to buy products from other countries. So the current trend is down. The projection is to continue to go down, which of course is good for imports. Uh, I mean for exports, but uh, we'll have the we'll have will force prices up on imports uh, into the United States. So here's what we call this is the Wall Street Journal index, and you can see what's happening to the dollar index. Uh, compared to um, the euro and the yen. And uh, 
if, le if the currency you're competing against um, is pegged to the dollar, then obviously like the peso, for example, then that will follow this. And in fact, it has. Um, but if it's not like this, you see the spread taking place. This is a, this happens to be from just one day, just a few weeks ago. It's a daily thing that comes out. You have to look at it well over time. But you can see this same trend here as the dollar goes down, the euro goes up, which means that goods from the European Union um, are more expensive relative to the dollar if they are competitive. So what's the difference between buying from the US and, uh, and Europe? Transportation costs. So if the price of, if the, price of the, the good is less, then it's the transportation costs that makes a difference between where they buy it. So uh, this gets us back to the part of the role of transportation and everything that we're doing. So let's talk a little bit about trade. Okay, uh, trade um, in 2016 was 26% of GDP. This is a lot less than most countries, most other advanced economies experience. They are basically trading companies and have been for millenniums. Um, millennia, I guess. Um, the U.S., of course, is the single largest importer and exporter. It's also the single largest debtor and creditor. Um, we do consume a lot of what we make here, but a lot of what we import is intermediate goods. So these are parts and assemblies. They're not finished products. They're parts and assemblies that come in to the United States to um, to be put into a final product assembly. So th that's a very important part. When we talk about trade deficits, which we're gonna do in just a second here, um, you have to keep in mind that 70% of world trade is intermediate goods. So, and even if you talk about NAFTA, if you talk about Mexico, for example, Mexico, of course, has a huge automotive um, industry down there um, that the, the products come back into the United States, but over 40% of the content of a car made in Mexico comes from U.S. suppliers. So it's not like there is no activity here. This gets back to this intermediate goods argument. Um, and so the more, there, many, many companies support are here. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why when you look at uh, the total cost of ownership being close to a strong supply base like we have in the United States, even though the final assembly may not be done in the United States, the the parts that go into that final assembly are coming, a high percentage are coming from the United States or a, or a significant percentage coming from the United States because of the quality of suppliers that are out there. And, and, that's, and that's true with other countries as well. Um, uh, so and we're gonna look at some of the protectionist things here, as I mentioned, so we'll do that in just a second. So here, here we are. We're looking at um, this is uh, this is from 2016. This is a, this was updated just recently, as you see. And the total uh, value here that we're looking at from the balance um, is we have goods, we have services, and the total balance was a negative 500 um, uh, billion dollars. So we have a we had a trade deficit of 500 and billion dollars. Now, when you look at, uh, in 2016, when you look at where that is, okay, you will see here, um, this happens to be merchandise, um, and you can see who we traded with. Uh, this is telling you who we traded with. Uh, our imports, number one location was $2 trillion from China, no surprise there. Uh, then Mexico, no surprise, Canada, Japan, Germany, South Korea, UK. So you can see that these are the people that we that we that we do most of our trade with, and then that then we ship back this way. And you can see that China, for example, rates very low at 115 billion compared to what we send to Canada and Mexico, which is of course NAFTA. Um, and so what we I'm sorry, 200 million. So what we want to try to do here is try to get that number up. This is what we're talking about. And so this gets us to this chart right here, oops, sorry, which is showing that in terms of all merchandise, now remember this is not services, this is merchandise, um, that China is, of the 500 million, China is 350 million of the total, of the total deficit. So when we talk about, let's go after 
Mexico and, and Canada, uh, Canada doesn't even show up on this chart as, as being uh, a major concern for us. Mexico does, but that's automotive. And that's primarily just due to that. But again, the content, a lot of that content is coming from here. So yes, there's things they could do probably that could be done or probably will be done, but, it's, but the big player is right here. So to bring you back to this slide right now, rather than rather than focus on on unilateral type activities, right now if we look at NAFTA, NAFTA is 28% of GDP. The EU is 20% of GDP. Had TTP gone in place, TTP is 12% of GDP. India would be seven and the UK would be four. And the important part here is these are all our allies. So the, these are all our allies. So the, 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 the tendency is in the rest of the world to develop multilateral trade agreements with blocks of countries like TTP. Uh, and the reason to do that is because you don't have a myriad uh, amount of customs rules that apply differently. So if you have a common set of, of duties and a common set of tariffs and a common set of uh, uh, documentation required to enter with 12, with uh, X number 18 countries in the EU, for example, uh, that's much simpler to trade with than it is to trade on an individual country basis. Not to say that some countries shouldn't be dealt with independently um, or directly or have to be. For example, India, you would have to do that. The UK, since they withdraw from the EU, you would have to do that there as well, too. But uh, this is exclusive all of China. We don't have any trade agreements with these folks. We don't have any. There's no trade agreement with the EU, but Japan has a trade agreement. Canada has a trade agreement. There's no agreement with TTP with anybody right now. That will probably change. Um, but the big one, of course, is 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 the EU. Uh, Mexico has a trade agreement with the EU, but the United States does not. I mean, sure, it's going to be complicated. But if we focus on this, the opportunity for us to grow um, our exports is quite significant, and it should be a far simpler discussion than it would be with with someone like China who is not our enemy, but is not necessarily our friend. So let's take a look at that because you've heard this term that the United States is turning protectionist. Well, I will guarantee you the rest of the world is more protectionist than the United States. And that's exactly what this chart shows. So you can just, just look at just look at the top line or just look at dairy products, okay? So this is milk, for example, and butter and things like that. Uh, the EU, of course, you can see uh, places a very heavy tariff burden on it. Uh, China places a much lighter tariff barrier on it, um, and the uh, U.S. Uh, on dairy products places an intermediate level. Okay, so this is protectionism around the world on a by-category basis. So the question then gets to these, these countries or these blocks basically are protecting these industries some cases subsidizing, but there's protection of all these industries going on around the world. All these countries do that. So what do you do? Well, this impacts on the flow, on the smooth flow of business. So basically what you do, you know, you have to go at this. You either have to say, okay, we're going to, we want to correct this. You can do this on a bilateral basis, which would be by country, or you can do this on a multilateral basis where you involve all these blocks, these trading blocks, and you and you work with the trading block. And that is probably, that's the direction the rest of the world is going, the U.S. being an exception. So, uh, uh, and that's somewhat recently. Uh, I think that's the current administration, really, because certainly the Obama administration was looking at multilateral agreements. Um, and you can do that. You can do it by country. You can do it by individual. You can do it by by product line by you can sanction them you can retaliate against them as being talked about now we're going to retaliate against china for steel for aluminum foil and they're going to come back and they're going to retaliate against us for something that we want to export to them and that's why this is a zero-sum game 
um, is that the farmers get upset because now they can't export their commodities because China's going to clamp down on China. If we do that, they retaliate by taking away a category that we are doing business with. Now, what's missing in all this argument is what we call foreign direct investment or FDI. So uh, the United States is a top is a top player in the FDI world, and most of our most of our investment comes from Germany, China, United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. So it, what that says is is that says that rather than export from these countries in the United States, they buy a company uh, or invest in companies uh, or plants or whatever in the United States. And therefore the money that we provide them through, um, that we provide them through, through the import side comes back into the, comes back into the, to the United States at some level. And uh, that's what, doesn't seem to ever get to be meted out in the argument. So if we look at what this means in the 20 period of 2016, uh, there's $390 billion of investment that came back in to the United States. Um, now, it didn't come back in. You can see here, uh, well, CH stands for Switzerland, okay? So this is guys, companies like Bayer, okay? Um, this is Ireland, UK, and Canada. So you don't see China appear in a big way, but China has, in terms of uh, in terms of major dollars, but China has also invested. Like they bought one of the largest uh, movie theater houses. Uh, they bought some real estate companies. Um, so again, FDI is an offset to the trade deficit. So the trade deficit of five hundred uh, billion dollars, uh, we should look at this as a reduction. Um, from a from a from a total basis, we should look at that as a reduction, and the trade deficit doesn't look so bad. Now, this is a natural thing that happens. I can tell you at Emerson, um, we wanted to grow the Chinese business from the Chinese factories and into a very substantial uh, domestic marketplace. You don't. We didn't want to. Emerson did not want to to. Uh, export goods from the United States into China to build a, build market share. They needed to be in China for all the reasons that China puts out there, just like the U.S. does. But that's the same thing. It's the same thing as Mazda and Toyota coming in here and saying, we're going to build a, uh, a $2 billion plant somewhere in the United States, or Foxconn coming in here and saying, we're going to build a billion dollar plant in Wisconsin. So at some point in time, the market becomes big enough to justify domestic investment. So we're, that's so as these major markets grow, China, um, India, Southeast Asia, as as these markets grow, companies will then locate plants because it makes sense on a cost basis to locate plants um, into the market itself, and this is true on a worldwide basis. So it's it's not limited to any one economy. It, this is the way it works. And uh, so your exports are going to go down, your imports, uh, you know, may go, may go up, uh, but then money has to find its way to something. There has to be some reinvestment of that money. Otherwise, it's, it's uh, uh, called reserves. So at the end of the day, where are we? We're right here. Um, we don't know where we're going yet. Uh, there's so much uncertainty here and it's impacting, again, the investments the government makes and businesses make as a result. We don't really know what these two, we don't really know where it is going to know what the implication is going to be. We don't know what's going to come out. So the fact that the U.S. is at the center of all this is, is really critical. Uh, and if there is a shock to the U.S. growth, then what happens around the world is, is going to be, uh, it's, it's going to filter, it's going to uh, move all the way across, it'll be a wave all the way across everything. Uh, some of the things they're talking about uh, are exactly the things we need to do. We'll talk about investment, infrastructure investment, and the lack thereof, and what that means, uh, and certainly income tax. I mean, the more money we have in the hands of the consumer, the better consumer sentiment gets, and the better consumer sentiment is we spend more money, that's caused demand. So. Hopefully it gives you a sense for what kind of where we are. So we'll stop with this one. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, transportation economics. Back in a minute.